So we're going to hear a few words from Julian. We're delighted that we have him with us, albeit some distance uh, and remotely this morning. And then I think there will be an opportunity for some questions from the floor, probably having to be delivered through me that we can ask Julian. So Julian, thanks very much for being with us. Uh, and we'll hear your words now, and then we'll, we'll, we'll have a conversation with those present here. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you, um, Brian, and uh, it's fantastic to uh, be here. I'm sorry that I'm not with you um, in person. I am particularly uh, sad not to be able to meet you, but also I gather there may be some uh, uh, good food. And um, one of my uh, great um, loves of Northern Ireland is the food and particularly uh, the scones. So I hope, uh, as well as good conversation over the coming days, you will be having some uh, good uh, good food. Um, and I know many of you have been part of many, many uh, difficult um, but meaningful conversations around some of the most challenging and personal of, is of issues during the period of this uh, programme. I pay tribute to Glenn Cree, um, to Rasheen and the programme organisers uh, but above all, um, I pay tribute to all of you here today and those who took part but who are not present uh, today. Uh, reading about the hundreds of engagements and dialogues that uh, you have had during this project um, has been incredibly positive um, in ensuring information exchange uh, and understanding and also contributing to civil society and government, hearing firsthand the horrors that many of you and your families um, have been through. So a huge congratulations to everybody for taking the time uh, and for your frankness and for your commitment and sharing and communicating your experiences. Barney's just talked a bit about my time in office and I'm grateful for his kind words, uh, um, but really it was a huge privilege uh, to do that role. I remembered the troubles uh, from my childhood. These were experiences I was seeing uh, on the screen in my television at home in Scotland. You were uh, living these experiences and living these horrors. And um, you know, it, I, I can't you know, begin to pay tribute to the fact that during programs like this, um, you're going back to those times and being open and communicating with others about them. I hope that following the ending of this program uh, that you'll find other ways of meeting and talking and sharing because I, the more I have um, worked with victims and survivors, uh, both are, of um, historic child abuse in Northern Ireland and troubles, um, this is dialogue and honesty is the only way that experiences of the past uh, can allow more honest and, and open. Northern Ireland has a fantastic and bright um, uh, future. The post-conflict generation in Northern Ireland is a great reason for hope. There is fantastic business innovation, world-beating creativity, uh, and despite the uh, current political situation, a new generation of civic uh, and political leaders. I was struck last week when I attended at the Northern Ireland Women in Business event in Belfast, that Northern Ireland is also home to ever increasing uh, diversity. From the years of death and destruction to the Good Friday Agreement and to peace and now to the future, your role, uh, all of you in this room, in building a clearer picture of the past is really vital to setting down the foundations for that uh, future. As you reflect over this event and about the past few years of this program, I, I hope you have confidence that what you've been part of is as important in opening up the past as it is to opening up the opportunities for the future. Northern Ireland has such incredible opportunities and you have and are playing a key role in ensuring that it can seize them. Generation to generation, having the paid the most dreadful of prices, you are hand, you're handing forward a better future. I hope the coming days are positive and engaging, and I look forward to hearing 
uh, more details of the conversations and engagements that you're about to have. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. And uh, what I'm now going to do is ask a couple of people in the room if they have a question that they want to put you. Uh, Kenny Donaldson is here near the front, so is Breeze. Kate Turner will tell you that I quite often take hostages at times like this to make sure that the dialogue uh, flows and continues. So we'll, we'll start with Kenny. Um, Kenny, I, I, if you can tell me what your question is and uh, I'll put it to Julian. Or if you want to come up and ask it, that's, that's absolutely fine. Whatever, possibly best if you stood here, Kenny. Are you, Julian? Hi, Kenny. Um, if the bill progresses without very substantive amendments to the areas of independence and governance and investigations being robust in construct, can you and others within your party who share such concerns walk through the government lobby in supporting the bill's implementation? So I did. So I. I, I Okay. Go, go on, yeah, so, so I think basically Kenny's question is without major amendment and and repair work on this bill, would, would, would someone like yourself be able to w support, vote for the government as this bill stands at this time? Is that right, Kenny? In summary, yeah. So thanks, Kenny. I mean, look, I didn't vote for what's called the second reading, the, the first introduction of this bill. Um, and I've made some fairly you know, direct remarks. Obviously, I, I, I um, want to make sure that change happens. But a, a, as things stand, uh, you know, I wouldn't be voting for this for the bill in its current form. I, I do think um, the issue of investigations is is so key. The government has made reassuring uh, comments uh, around that the fact that these will be full uh, investigations, but the fact of the matter is on the in the bill itself, the, the, that is not explicit. So um, I think we do need to see significant improvements to the bill. Um, I'm obviously hugely regretful that, um, you know, many victims and survivors feel that they haven't been more part of uh, the process of getting uh, to this bill. I, I had hoped when we had introduced new decade new approach that we would have quite intensive discussions i you know I, i'm i'm sure uh, it, it, it's difficult if not impossible to um, get full agreement on every element but i think my um, parallel concern as well as the content of the bill is that um, you know uh, those intensive discussions to bring people along appear not to have happened Julian, I'm trying to read a, a note here from, from Kenny. So I, I think uh, if we heard you correctly, in its current form, you would not support the government with this bill. And in terms of what needs to change, it is that investigative, uh, much more robust investigative approach uh, and that continuing search for justice. Uh, have we heard you correctly on that? That's correct. You happy enough, Kenny? Yeah? Uh, he's, Kenny's asking, would you vote against the bill or would you merely abstain? Abstain, I should say. Well, I mean, I think on that, I, uh, I abstained in the second reading um, and um, I will obviously look to see what the government has done. Um, it's going through committee stage this uh, week, starting that. So that's the detailed sort of um, um, analysis of the bill. And, and then it will um, go through further, this broader discussion, go to the House of Lords. So it's got some way to go. Um, I'll be working, you know, and, and putting pressure on to get those changes. Um, and then, you know, I will review it. But I didn't, you know, I, I didn't vote for it at second reading. And, you know, I do hope that some of those improvements can be made. OK, Julian, thanks. I'm going to bring Breeze uh, up from, do you, do you want to come this far, Breeze? You'll tell me, okay? Breeze is going to give me a question. Uh, the fact of it is, the inquest that we had 
that it took 100 days, it worked. So why are they saying that there is nothing there that works? It worked. When we first went on for our inquest, we only went home to find information. But when Justice Keenan said that our loved ones were entirely, entirely innocent, that was absolutely amazing. Now, we, won't, we didn't get justice. As far as we can see, all the British government are interested in is covering their soldiers back. And I just feel what made it stand out even more was when we were in court that they couldn't remember. The soldiers were saying they couldn't remember who they were in regiments with. But at the same time, you've got World War I and Two, where there is loads of history, details of our soldiers, but for some reason, the MOD couldn't provide definite information of who was there and who was on the ground. Okay. Uh, Julian Breeze is just making the point about the importance of the inquest process. Uh, and that, that statement that the victims of Bala Murphy were in, entirely innocent, in Breeze's words, that was uh, absolutely amazing, that, that, that comment. Uh, her concern, and I imagine it's a wider concern, is that the purpose of this bill and this legislation is to, in Breeze's words, cover uh, the soldiers' backs. So I, I wonder if you could pick up on that, Julian, with a, a few thoughts of your own. Well, uh, firstly, um, uh, you know, the, the, the work Breeze, you and other fam the other families put in and, you know, the length of time it's taken, but the commitment you have had um, to uh, bringing it to conclusion was incredible, to uh, absolutely amazing. And, um, you know, the result was extremely clear. Um, I, I think what's been important in inquests like that, in uh, Operation Canova uh, and other examples, is that information has come out that there has eventually been uh, more transparency and, and we should be encouraging that and i did ask a question when the government introduced the uh, legacy bill around inquest and whether there could be some flexibility about uh, when uh, those inquests um, uh, are cut off because as you know there's a pipeline of inquests um, and that pipeline was uh, agreed a, a year or so ago um, and I think one of the things as the bill goes through the Commons, we, we should all be pushing for is for much more flexibility about um, allowing uh, many more of those inquests to go ahead. Now, I, the government indicated it might be open to that, but um, obviously the, the proof of the pudding is in the in the uh, in the eating. I think just going back to um, transparency from UK government. Um, I mean, I, I, I think I and others would encourage as much openness uh, as possible. Um, and, um, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, we, we can encourage through this bill, uh, you know, some of the patterns that we've seen in Operation Kenover where um, information has been more, more, um, more forthcoming. You also made the point, Julian, that it's not just about the state, that uh, the transparency that people are looking for is across that, that conflict frame. It's about the IRA, it's about the loyalist organisations, it's about the Irish government. Um, there has been a particular focus on collusion and on the state, but, but our truth is in a much wider frame than that. I'm going to see if there's another question before we let you go. Um, David Clement. So we've got David Clements here, Julian. Thank you, Barney, and thank you, Julian, for your input today. Um, I was sitting beside you at that breakfast at Wave that you referred to in your speech in the House of Commons, um, eating a, a huge fry, uh, when you came to spend hours and hours uh, with the uh, injured group. And uh, of all the Secretary of States that I've ever had uh, dealings with, uh, you seem to be being the one that listened most carefully. And I just want to underline what Barney said about that uh, in his introduction. And my question is, 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 is this, if the bill goes through, as perhaps most of us think it will, in whatever form with whatever amendments that might improve it to some extent, have you got any thoughts on how we might mitigate the worst effects of that 
on victims. Well, thanks for your comments, David. And it was a, a, a fantastic um, uh, session that Saturday morning and the, the fry was particularly, um, particularly good. So thank you uh, again. Um, I think obviously I'm, I and others are trying to get a balance between making criticism of the bill, but also seeing if these if improvements can be can, you know, can be made. I mean, we've got people, for example, uh, like John Boucher um, at, um, at Can Canova. Now, if if the government could make changes, if the government could get somebody like him uh, as the chief invest investigator, you know, it may be that there is a chance to. Um, move forward uh, uh, um, and regain some of the some of the trust so I suppose my my answer to your question would be uh, again to push and encourage the government at this relatively late stage to try to re-engage and build uh, trust uh, now um, there will be some of you here today that may feel that's very difficult if not impossible but I think um, that will be where our, I think our focus should be. How do we, at this late stage, try to uh, ensure that um, you, you, you know trust it can be rebuilt? I mean, I would have liked to have seen, for example, after after that introduction of the bill, a pause, and then discussions like this, and you know more input at, at, at that at this stage. I don't think that's going to happen, uh, but I would encourage the government to really listen to what people in this room are saying uh, about um, you know, what is needed to hear, again, Breesia's experience and the experience of other uh, families who have successfully um, got uh, 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 um, clarity uh, about what has what happened. Um, and I think we need to just keep pushing the government to do that. So I would encourage all, you know, if, if there's, I know some, um, some groups have been across to Westminster the more pressure you could, you could put on government. I think, I hope uh, there may be a, one or two civil servants were planning to come today. I don't know if they've made it, but I think the more pressure you can put on, uh, the better. Uh, Julian, I just want to ask you one question before we let you go. I talked about the new decade, new approach agreement where yourself and Simon Coveney, after a three year period in limbo, managed to put Stormont back together again. How concerned are you at this time? That, that our politics has, has fallen again, that Stormont has stumbled again, uh, and that we seem to be in another of those, those, those periods of not working. Uh, and I, I suppose that amounts to another missing piece in our piece, not just this legacy question that we're discussing today, but the fact that we don't have a government at this time. Well, it's a real uh, blow that the, you know, Stormont is not up and running. I'm, I'm pleased that we've got ministers. So we, in the deal that Simon and I put together, there are ministers operating, but obviously no assembly and no executive. That's having an impact on the budget and other issues. So I would, I would really encourage people to get back back to work. Um, I, I guess it is extremely frustrating, uh, but I do underneath see a, a desire for um, from all of the parties to get back into uh, power sharing. And I also see, I mentioned it in my remarks, some really good younger um, uh, MLAs. It's a sort of record number of female candidates and female MLAs in this last election. Um, and I I'm quietly hopeful uh, that although we've got this very strong turbulence at the moment, uh, that we can move forward and um but obviously that requires trust it requires confidence um and i accept that at the moment um those are not in huge supply but i i do i, I do believe ultimately that the politicians in northern ireland do want to serve julian thanks very much for your time this morning i I'll ask you to thank Julian Smith yourselves for, for your words, your thoughtful words, your thinking, and for taking time to speak into this conference organized by Glencree. Thank you very much, Julian. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.